Okay, this morning we are continuing our core sermon series. We've been going through this for about 15 weeks. Is that right? It's going to keep going. Uh, where we, we're looking at our essential uh, traits or values as, uh, at St. Philip's. And we're looking at this conviction today, that at St. Philip's we pursue holiness. This pursuit of holiness is our yes to God's invitation in Scripture to be holy as I am holy. And now, if we want to understand the meaning of holiness and we want to live a life of holiness, we have to start by looking at the most holy one. That's where you you begin. And Isaiah 6 provides that opportunity for us. Isaiah is afforded this absolutely stunning vision of the Lord. And we actually kind of sung about this moment. And it's there that we discern actually three aspects, three dimensions of holiness that can define our lives. And it's this. We discover that holiness is a life ablaze in beauty, in fruitfulness, and in purity. So Lord, make us burn for you. Isaiah 6 reads this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me and a live coal, with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Okay, the occasion for this whole scene is, is um, stated in that first verse. It's the year of national mourning. King Uzziah reigned for a long time. And he'd done right in the eyes of the Lord, and he brought sustained prosperity and peace, and he's died. And now there are these murmurs abounding as to what will become of God's people after this prolonged sense of peace and prosperity. And we actually experienced that, wasn't it, last year with our queen. We get that sense, a year of mourning. And the nation's heads are cast low, but Isaiah's is suddenly lifted up with a shocking encounter. And I've got this beautiful, this beautiful picture of what he sees. And maybe, hopefully, it will come up on the screen. You can see Isaiah at the bottom... <laughs> Isaiah witnesses the true king, Yahweh, the living God, high and exalted, enthroned in glorious majesty. And the supremacy of God's rule is confirmed through the sheer length of his robe. (laughs) So I, I found this out, this was fascinating. In the culture of the day, kings who then conquered other nations and defeated their kings, what they do is go up to the king, who had this long robe, would snip off, or not with scissors, but cut off their train or length of the robe and sew it onto theirs. Their robe would grow. And if they had, you know, continually defeated nations, it would be longer and longer and longer. The longer the train, the more power. In Isaiah's vision, however, the train of the Lord's robe is so long It fills the entirety of of his heavenly temple. It's a sure sign that the Lord is the king over all. 
And we see the undisputed rule and glory of God declared by these angelic beings called the seraphim. The term seraphim means the burning ones. Their whole being is ablaze in glory because they reflect the one whom they stand before and because they burn with awe and delight for him. And the seraphim express their devotion, particularly through their behavior and their speech. We see the seraphim assuming a range of positions with each of their set of wings. One set covers their eyes in awe and adoration. Another set, they're ready to fly, poised to respond in service. And then there's another set before covering their feet in humility before God. And we recall the, uh, the story of Moses at the burning bush taking off his sandals in humility. And the seraphim, they start calling out to one another in fervent speech what it is they're actually seeing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. Their posture and their praise thus convey what God's, God's holiness means. First, we see that God's holiness is the visible splendor of his majesty, it's his beauty. And so we see the idea of God's holiness as the quality of his appearance in Isaiah's mention of God high and lifted up and how the whole earth is full of his glorious beauty. And scripture is actually rife with that connection of God's holiness with his beauty. Let me show you three scriptures here. There's one in Exodus 15, 11, which says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Or Psalm 29, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Or 1 Chronicles 16, 29, Give the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Now, if God's holiness partly describes his glorious appearance, how can we be holy like that in that fashion? Now, a clue, I think, is in the blazing nature of the seraphim. They reflect the glory of God. Due to their proximity, they're really close to him, and because of their worship, through lives that burn in worship, in their behavior, and in their, in their speech, the seraphim experience this vitality and intensity of life. They're alive that mirrors the glorious holiness of God. We discover from the seraphim that we become like what we behold. And I believe that's a vision of, of St. Philip's. We become what we behold. Worship changes us. And the question is always, what are we worshiping? And we see that transformative effect in Acts, for example, with Stephen before he's, he's being stoned to death. Before he dies, it's said of him that his appearance changes to like that of one of these burning ones, one of these angels. His life is so surrendered to Christ, his whole demeanor takes on this complexion and sense and air of one of the angels in awe and in, at peace, loving the Lord. And I was rifling through the people I know in my life, you guys here and throughout my history. I know people who love the Lord and they're without any airs or graces, without putting anything on, their very presence alone exudes the warmth of the Lord's joy or his peace or his kindness, the beauty of holiness. When they walk into the room, something changes. So the seraphim showed to us a pattern of, for our lives that through worshipful lives of awe, of service, of humility to the most holy one, the complexion and the character of our very being can change. We become ablaze in beauty. The second thing we discover about God's holiness is, it, is that it's the source of all life. The seraphim, they declare how the whole earth is full of God's glory. It's full of his beauty, full of his, the beauty of his holiness. And I love that. 
God is so glorious and majestic. He doesn't just reserve that to himself. It bursts forth in creative action to make and sustain the world with teeming life and fruitfulness and blessing. Everywhere we look, the earth is populated with a bountiful effect of God's presence with us. In the beautiful diversity, biodiversity of our world, wild animals, song and dance, architecture, my daughter's belly laugh, my little boy's smudge paintings, we see the Lord's beauty on display. We walk amongst miracles. The Lord's beauty is everywhere we go. We live in a God bathed world. We're engulfed by his glorious presence. And it means there's no sacred, secular, or sacred, unsacred divide in this world where God's love and his care and his presence is absent. There's no such thing. There's no such divide. It's all sacred. That is the very assertion, actually, of Genesis. Genesis presents this world as his temple, as his sacred dwelling place. That's what we read in the first, in the first chapter. This is sacred. And the, uh, the main way, there are many ways it, it describes that, but the main way is this, that we've been made in the image of God. When, when Genesis was written, the surrounding cultures understood the image as an idol statue, the image of the gods, as an idol, a piece of wood. When these nations would uh, would build their temples, and at the end, when it was coming to, to finish, they would go, Poof. they'd put the idol down and say, the gods are here. Here's the proof. Yeah? And you can see in the Old Testament why the prophets are always arguing against the idols. Don't worship these idols. They're not alive. The nation said, no, this is the proof that gods are here. And when this temple was finally built in these neighboring nations, the gods were said to rest and reign over their kingdom. Genesis says, no, that's utterly wrong. The image of God is you guys, is us. We are the proof. We display God's life in the world. And then in uh, day seven, God rests. And he reigns over his temple, over his sacred, sacred dwelling. That is utterly beautiful. We are the evidence of God's life and blessing and fruitfulness in the world. And it has massive implications for what holiness means. Holiness is not about drawing away from the world, hiding away to try and preserve us away from, from the stain of the world. No, this is God's sacred world. We're images of God. We're to immerse ourselves in the world and fill it with his blessing to be fruitful and multiply. That is not just about having children. <laughs> that is about being so uh, wonderfully fruitful in our lives that we fill this world with the God colors. And Jesus himself said that in Matthew 5. I love the translation in, in the message. It says, Jesus says, you're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. And then he goes on to say, you're a city on the hill, and you don't put a a bowl over the lamp, shine, be in the world, lean in and bring my blessing. You're a source of life. And so, this has very ordinary practical implications. Our Monday to Saturday lives with their school runs, their laundry, their food shopping and being surrounded by the office gossip, their moments in God's sacred world to, be, to actively express Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruits of the Spirit for the flourishing of all we meet. We're supposed to burn in this world with God's life and love. We are supposed to be the examples of God's presence in the world. We're supposed to be holy. So holiness is not just this beauty that naturally emanates from a life of worship. It's also a proactive life. We all have different scenarios. When we leave this place, we all go to different places. But wherever we go, there are settings and contexts for us to just explode with God's love and God's life. Holiness is a life ablaze in fruitfulness. Now, 
whilst there are no unsacred places that are devoid of God's presence, there are desecrated places. Places where God's goodness of crea- in creation has been abused. And we see in this passage, we see in Isaiah himself and his people, they, they are living lives of desecration. He declares, woe to me, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal and it goes on to say that his guilt was taken away and his sin was atoned for. And it's there we learn the final aspect about God's holiness. It's not just his beauty, it's not just the source of life, it's his total purity. Part of God's holy being is, as I say, it's not his appearance or what he does, it's also who he is. God is the source of all goodness and righteousness. And in 1 John, it states it this way, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Yet there's this paradox at the heart of God's being that that his purity becomes dangerous for sinners who want to draw near to him. He's so good it becomes dangerous for us. And we see that throughout Scripture. A number of people who discover this for themselves. And we have Moses. He sees the burning bush. He draws closer. He's getting closer. Don't come any closer. You're standing on holy ground. It becomes dangerous for him. The high priests in the tabernacle, there were divisions, there were curtains. You wouldn't get any closer. At least once a year, the high priest was allowed to go into the most holy place. But that was a scary moment for him. And then Isaiah has this this moment of utmost proximity with the Most Holy One, and he considers himself doomed. The removal, though, of sin by the seraphim on behalf of God is actually a foretaste of what God will one day provide for the world. And we we live now in the, um, the experience of that. It occurred as Christ came into the world and died on the cross, All our sins have been removed. We continually have access to God that Isaiah experiences, yet it's devoid of fear and it's full of joy. And we're told by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians that we have this. Christ's atoning death renders us before God holy and blameless. He sees us as holy and blameless and we can just live before him with such peace. Yet... The Apostle Paul also calls us to pursue holiness, that we act blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then we will shine like stars in the sky. So if we want to pursue holiness and act out who God sees we are, we learn from Isaiah that we gain perspective on what is right and wrong, ultimately from the Lord, not from our society. There's a lot of information and a lot of um, guidance as to how we are to live our lives and what is right and what is wrong, who should be removed, who should stay. There's a lot of, of messaging about that wherever we go. Isaiah discovers, though, that in the year that King Uzziah died, when the nation are mourning and murmuring, he's shown the Holy One, and that utterly transforms how he understands reality itself. It's a very different way now what life is, how it's actually conceived and constructed. Now the Lord alone determines the approved way of living in which he may affirm, certainly he may affirm aspects of culture, but he also may show aspects to be suspect. God's not completely against our society. He loves the world. But there are times when the world is faultless, is warped and crooked. Where do we gain that sense from? from the Lord himself. That's where we begin. And so it requires us to immerse ourselves in Isaiah's prophecy and and his word and in the rest of scripture where we discover the glory of God and we discover the script to live a holy life ablaze in purity. So Isaiah's glorious vision shows us that holiness is not simply about do's and don'ts. I think that's what we, when we come to this, uh, this idea of pursuing holiness, it's like, I can do this, but I can't do that. It's not simply this. It's more, as one writer puts it, holiness is the most attractive quality, 
the most intense experience we ever get of sheer life. It's being fully alive. That's what pursuing holiness is. It's the invitation to be alive as God is and as God intended for us. A blaze in beauty, fruitfulness, and purity. And so I, I want to call us all to join Isaiah, offering our lives in the pursuit of holiness in God's world, not running away, playing a part in this world and saying, here I am, send me. Amen. Lord, set us ablaze. Amen.